This episode contains detailed personal stories of childhood sexual assault and may not be suited for all audiences. Your discretion is advised. Is it too loud? Nope, perfect. All right, cool. What is up, everyone? This is Joe Adams, and welcome to the Relentless Pursuit Podcast. What we do on this podcast is bring in guests from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life, to share their story and take us along the journey that led them to where they're at today. We touch on a multitude of different topics, and we leave nothing off the table. We're here to inspire. We're here to make an impact, and that's what we do. So check us out. If that is for you, like, subscribe, all those wonderful things. If that is not for you, I don't know what your problem is, but you need to jump on board now and show us some love. Thank you. But without further ado, I would love to introduce our guest today. Mrs. Renee Arn. Thank you. Welcome. Hey, it's good to have you. It's good to have you. So, Renee, um, it's good to have you, but we got, sorry, I'm getting all all over the place. We had Hannah Cole on recently, and she that was a wonderful episode. I forget which one it was. It's like one no seven. And Hannah sent me your information, connected us. Said you'd be a wonderful guest. You have a story that needs to be heard. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I love Hannah. She is what she does has really helped me a lot. It's really cool. Um, Jesse does a lot of that kind of stuff here. Yeah, I'll have to introduce you if he's around afterward. But he uh similar type of stuff with the frequencies and all those different things. And it's uh, incredible. Yeah, she brought me in her space and gave me the whole run through with all of it. And I was like, you know, two hours there. It was yeah. cool. <laughs> Super cool. It is cool. I felt good. Yeah. Learned a lot. Um about myself but yeah it's very important so and i take it you've been going to her for a minute yeah about uh almost three months now nice yeah. oh yeah hey she's yeah. crushing it yes she is i have no plans to stop seeing her i love it yeah and it's it's good stuff it's good medicine you know it's not like pharmaceuticals or anything like that like it's stuff that heals your mind absolutely and uh does so many things for you yeah i'm such a fan of talk therapy but this has just been a whole nother layer of healing mm-hmm. um I think you need all different kinds of aspects, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah that, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say those energetic pathways are something I never really thought about. And, you know, obviously knew we had an energetic level, but what she's taught me has just really made a difference. That's cool. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I'm big on therapy too. I go to therapy. I just went therapy yesterday. So it's, I think it's good to have all those different aspects in order to, you know, because if you can heal, you can maximize yourself. Absolutely. You know, but a lot of people can't really maximize who they are or who they're supposed to become because they have so many roadblocks exactly within them and it's all starts here yeah you know and it improves all aspects of life i mean it truly does yeah yeah so real quick um and then we'll take it back and we'll start with the journey but just tell us what it is that you do now uh, i'm a writer and advocate for sexual and domestic violence okay um, i'm a native tennessean i was born in chattanooga and raised in a small town called deckard Tennessee. Where's that at? Near Sewanee. You've heard of Is that in the mountains? Uh, yeah, Franklin County. It's down on the Alabama border, not far from Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. Is it close to? It's close to Tullahoma that we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love it out that way. Yeah. Um, there's a place in There's a place in Alabama I love to go. It's a mountain area. I'm going to bring it back up, but okay. it's, it's, it's really <laughs> cool. It's, dang it, I can't forget. I've done the Airbnbs there, but it's yeah. beautiful out that way. Yeah, the Appalachians run straight, kind of, kind of end in Huntsville or like right above it. Oh, that's awesome! I didn't know that. I believe so. Yeah, if I got like the mapping correct <laughs> in my in my mind. But anyways, um, beautiful area. Did you like it? What was it like? Uh, I did. You want to tell us a little bit about your childhood and your upbringing and whatever that you know take us along that part of the journey a little bit. Yeah, I I was uh, I was in that area from about four until I left for college. Okay, and um. A lot of my story begins there, difficult parts, um, but there were good parts too. There always are. Yeah. And uh, have a younger brother, younger sister, and really close with them, and grew up around a lot of my mother's family. Okay. My dad's family all lives in Florida, so we got to see them 
usually just once a year. Okay. But a very close knit family, and some problems stemmed from that, and but mostly it was a good thing. Yeah, uh, family is a difficult subject, right? Because yes. you're it's so close and so personal. Yep. But um, I don't know you, when there's conflict, right? It's it's more difficult to resolve things. Absolutely, and and for me, like church was very heavily intertwined with that, and so there were just some really powerful structures that made it very hard for me to uh, break out of what was happening. Yeah, those uh, condition the conditioning yep. aspect of it. Yep. Is church still a pretty heavy part of your life now, or it is? Uh, but I've kind of made it my own. Yeah, of uh, course. You know, I needed to. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was taught it a certain way, which I think wasn't helpful in a lot of ways, especially as a woman. And um, my faith is is one of my favorite aspects of my life now. Yeah. But it's not oppressive anymore. Yeah, of course. Yeah, those some of those structures are a little can yep. be can be that way. Yep. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. so and a lot of people I've talked to on this podcast actually have like kind of regrew the structure for themselves with when it comes to faith. Absolutely. Yeah. And you got to do it, you know, you understand and what your heart is guided to, right? Right. And, yeah. and the, you know, it's not that I'm twisting the Bible to be what I need it to be. It's just that I was taught it in a way that was very harmful. Well, yeah. And you know, a lot of people, how many, there's so many different versions of it now, you know, so there's so many different church structures. Right. People, people perceive things their own way, right? Exactly. Like it all starts with the book. You open it and you take what you do from it. It's not supposed to be how somebody else looks at it. Right. Right? Because how do you know they're they're looking at it correctly? Exactly. Right? What does your heart tell you? Right. How do you understand it that way? Yeah, but how I was raised, it was like, no, this is the way. Yeah. And I, I took that as fact for a very long time. Yeah. And it was very hard to break out of that mentality and that belief. But once I did, I was like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Life's good now. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And not self-serving. Not yeah. a self-serving life, but a, a life that has freedom and air and space. Of course. You need to be a person. That's important, yeah. And I mean, you know, I got my beliefs, um, but, it, you know, a lot of it was based off of my, you know, how, I mean, I was brought up well, but just my viewpoint on church and, like, hearing things and how, like, it's supposed to be this way, and I just could never really connect with it, you know, and I'm led to the path I'm on now. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful, not self-serving either, um, but just the freedom I have and the purpose I have and the fire, you know, but I think that's, you know, if I can teach my daughter, like, let your heart guide you when it comes to spirituality, like, right. that's the that's the key right there. Right. You know, so. Because we are spiritual beings. Yeah. We have a spiritual influence inside of us. And I think a lot of our culture has taught us to, like, shut that down. Oh, yeah. And that's a problem. Yeah, it, it becomes more of like, like, like we said, like the word structure. It becomes yeah. a structured, rigid yeah. thing, and I don't. It's so big. How did? How do you make this thing just one way? Right. And the way I was taught it was very legalistic, and you're supposed to figure it out up here. Mm-hmm. This shouldn't have anything to do with how you serve. Yeah. It's like, oh, no, that's a big mistake. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, everybody thinks they know the answers, though. That's right. Yeah. You know, but uh, my the way I believe isn't right for you, right? So, I mean, it just makes sense. Right. The way you believe isn't necessarily how I'm going to perceive it. Right. So, absolutely. You know, why are we supposed to agree? We can still yeah. get along, and right? That is perfectly okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's a big push of mine on here, honestly, is so because I bring up to light, you know, it's my spiritual path is brought to light a lot on this podcast. So, I'm able to educate people on my beliefs because there's a lot of skewed um, misunderstandings of it. Right. So, I have the opportunity to kind of like shed light on that but also bring people together and open minds and open hearts and like connect people you know and break that religious kind of like oh you know because a lot of people hate you if if you think different than they do when it comes to that it turns into us and them yeah and once you put anyone in the other category those other people you dehumanize them yep like they're not human to you anymore so you can talk badly about them you can treat them badly it just it changes your ability to treat them well. Yeah. And I have a big problem with that. Yeah. It is not okay to objectify people. No, it's not. On any level. Yeah, 100%. I agree. I mean, when it's really all of us and them, you know, and I, right. uh, them, I'm like the government. <laughs> so <laughs> they don't care about us. But no, let's not go down there. And don't shut me down. <laughs> but anyway, so, okay. Um, Back to the journey, you know, working your way through school and whatnot. You you grew up in that small town. Um, what was after that for you? You know, you, you took off from there. Where did that lead you? 
Uh, so I uh, left home, went to college at, here at MTSU. Oh, same. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's where I met uh, the person I married. Um, I have a hard time calling him a man. It has to be in air quotes. Um, but, yeah, and that that's kind of the second half of my story. Um, rather than start chronologically, chronologically uh, my story of who I am right now actually begins on July 5th, 2013. Okay. So we were in South Carolina. It was me and my husband at the time, our three children. Two were teenagers. One was preteen. Okay. Uh, we were there visiting uh, a family member. We were in a little lake cabin. And uh, I needed to look up a recipe. And my phone didn't have service. Yeah. So I was like, hey, can I use your phone to look up the recipe? And he's like, yep, that's great. And um, so I pulled up Google and there's a porn search. Mm. And I was like, I mean, this is something that had been in our marriage for a long time. Uh, we've been through many cycles of like, okay, you got to get a handle on this. And, and so it had been a long time since we had had any conversations about that. And we just celebrated our uh, 20th wedding anniversary. Um, and so I just asked him about it. I wasn't upset. I mean, this is something that was fairly normal. Yeah. So I wasn't agitated at all. And he was like, oh, no, no, that was the kids. And I'm like, oh, I actually blamed it on our youngest. And I was like, okay, that's really disturbing to me. As her mother, yeah, <laughs> like, oh, this is a huge failure. But he just kept denying and just pushing off the question. And finally, I just got in his face. And I'm like, look, if this is really not you, then I've got to figure this out. Yeah. And he happened to be watch. You can't pawn it off on the kids. I know. <laughs> and I'm like, you've got so much history. Like, like, I've always said, just tell me the truth. Yeah. You know, I'm not a freak out sort of person. Just don't lie to me. Yeah. So he happened to be standing at the sink washing dishes. And the moment I was like, you've got to deal with me on this. He turns around. He has this big butcher knife in his hand and he's holding it up. I'm 5'2". He's 6'5". I don't think he had any intention of attacking me with a knife. But just the image of that. The fact that he, <laughs> yeah, you're like that's not even yeah. something you joke around yeah. with. And so he wheels around with this knife up and it's like, of course it's me. What do you think? are you stupid? And I was like, no. I'm, I mean, of course I freeze, but in my mind, I'm like, no, I'm not stupid. I know it's you. This, it, In my mind, all of this was ridiculous. Like, yeah. <laughs> and he could have just told the truth. It was that right, simple. Right. Yeah. I'm like, you just put me through half a day of mentally just being in anguish about this. So anyway, that kicked off a lot of problems. Within a month, I, I lost a lot of weight. I was non-functional. I started therapy. And I just was at the point where I really couldn't do the, my normal routines. Mm -hmm. I was in my first full-time job, the only full-time job that I had in the years that I had children at home. Yeah. So that was a big change for all of us. Um, and, you know, the kids were about to start back to school. I lost a lot of weight. I, I started with a therapist. Um, and I went in and I was like, you've got to help me fix my marriage. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Yeah. It was all my fault. Oof. <laughs> and, uh, you know, early on, she was like asking me different things. Has this happened? Does this happen? I'm saying yes to everything. And she's like, this is abuse. And I would have none of that. Nope. You're wrong. Not abuse. Yeah. Nope. I, I'm not working hard enough. The denial. Yep. <laughs> and that went on. I mean, she was wonderful. She knew when to push me. She knew when to give me space. Um, so that was July. In November, I woke up from a dream one night. And I, it was, I got out of bed, went to my computer and just wrote it. And I got up the next morning and I was like, was that a dream? Did I dream the dream and that I got up and wrote? Yeah. <laughs> but no, it was on my computer. And so what that memory was, was one that I had had the whole time, my whole life of me and my uncle going to his bedroom, but there was more that mm. I had not remembered. So I was four years old. Sickening. Yeah, I was four years old. Um, he took me up to his bedroom. There was an, uh, he lived with my grandparents. He was still a teenager. And there was a new batch of kittens. And all I wanted to do was go outside and play with kittens. Yeah. So I'm like, can we go play with the kittens? And he's like, no, no, let's go up here for a minute. And so I'm standing at the window looking down at the kittens tumbling around in the yard. And he's like, okay, let's sing Jesus Loves Me together. And I was like, okay. And so he sang Jesus Loves Me. And then he put me on his bed took off my clothes and, um and so that was the part I didn't remember I remembered mm. 
going to his room, which I never had really done before. I mean, I was a little kid. Yeah. Um, remember the kittens, remember Jesus loves me, but not the part on the bed. And that is how my repressed memories came back for about a year. They would come back in dreams. And so I, that was my habit. I'd get up, write it down, and go right back to sleep. That's, that's rough. Yeah. And so once, we, and of course I'm telling my therapist all of this, we work through it. Um, turns out like the, the abuse started at four and it didn't end until I was 11. And when I was five, my aunt um, joined in. So it was my mom's youngest brother and her sister. She was my Sunday school teacher. She was the teacher for the five-year-olds. I was so excited to be in her class, but she started abusing me right before I promoted into her class. And I was like, how do I not be in her class now? Yeah. <laughs> I've waited for years, and now she's teaching me about God. And, and I had, you know, they all, we all went to church together, my grandparents, the two of them, and my whole family. And so sometimes I would have to sit in their laps. You know, they would blow on the back of my neck or they would play with the hem of my dress. I mean, it was just absolute torture. Good and, God. <laughs> yeah, I was really, really sick. Um, and then often we would go to my grandparents' house for lunch after. And that's very often when the abuse would happen. So I would go from church, you know, trying not to throw a fit on the way to my grandparents' house. One time I, I, I did kick the back of my dad's seat because I was so distressed. And, and I got a spanking. Because they, they didn't know. They didn't know why yeah. I was upset and agitated, and that wasn't normal for me. Um, and so I got spanked, and then I had to go into the house, and all that other stuff happened. And it was just like, I'm never going to pitch a fit again. God. I'm, I'm never, you know, cause at least I can get away without the spanking. Yeah. Which I don't fault my dad for. So you just pre you suppress it. Yeah. God, yeah. Bottle it in. Yeah. And so... Um, I didn't, the abuse didn't stop until my aunt eventually moved out of my grandparents' house. She lived in her own apartment, and I went over there to spend the night one night. And she was kind of the fun aunt. Uh, you know, she would do special things for us, which I now see as grooming. Yeah. But um, this night, it, I don't think I slept. I mean, she bathed me. It was just, I was 11. <laughs> and it was just the longest night, and I, she drove me home the next day, and I'm like, this is never going to happen again. This can't happen. I cannot take this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it was an episode of Little House on the Prairie not too long after that in October of 81. And it was a two-part series about there was a circus and a clown raped a girl in a neighboring town. I, I haven't had the courage to go back and watch the episode. Yet. Yeah. Um, but all the people in the town were outraged that this had happened to this girl. And in that moment, I was like, they didn't ever use the word rape or anything, but I'm like, I think this is what was happening to me. Yeah. And wow. If I tell somebody, will, um, will they help me? Will somebody be outraged? Will I get help? Uh, so I got the courage to tell my mom. <laughs> and when I told her, of course I didn't have words for what was happening. And she said, okay, I'll go talk to your grandmother. I'll get back to you. She didn't hug me. She didn't move toward me. There was no alarm. Or anything. Yeah. So a few days later, she came back and she said, well, <clears throat> we've talked and, you know, this is really embarrassing. And if this gets out, um, all the men in the family will lose their jobs. So do you want your cousins to go hungry? Isn't that crazy? Like. Yeah. Which pe is. People are so willing to cover it up. Yeah. Even like the closest to you. Yeah. And you're like, what the hell? Yeah. And so this is just more like riding on my empathy, right? Of course, I don't want my cousins to go hungry. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, put that on your shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, teenage years, I mean, there was. I, I Real quick, you know, it's wild. You know, the, I've had a lot of conversations on here and just in general, right? And, you know, people tend to open up and you realize this, how common this theme is. It and, is. And then the fact that it's like family members. Yeah. And even like religious leaders. Uh, you know, that commit these acts. It's mostly those people. It's mind-blowing. And it's just like, I try to not put myself in their shoes, but I try to, like, how to get into their mind. Like, how is this acceptable? Like, what is what switched in order to make you think this is okay? And, and 
and pursue such action. Like we all have intrusive dark thoughts right. that come in and you're like me, I just like punch those thoughts. I'm like, yeah. no, nah, I mean, they're nothing like that, but right, right. you know, I've just had like just crazy things that pop in my head. I'm like, no, you know, I'm better than that. I just think that's just evil trying to seep its way in in some way. Um, hell, just in traffic or something, you know, right. and I'm like, Arr. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, but you, I can't put myself there. And I'm like, how the hell, like it, the fact that it is so common, it just blows my mind. Right. Well, and not all people who ab sexually abuse children are actually pedophiles. It's often a matter of opportunity. So, because a pedophile technically would be someone that's like, like, like basically like hunts, you know. Right. They're proactively doing that right. towards all kinds of kids right. or whatever. But yeah, but it, the, the still, I mean, how would yeah. you classify them? Because it's still like pedophilia, right? Well, yes, but um, many, ch I think it's 40% of children are abused by a minor. Mm. So cousin, sibling. I see. And so that, that I wouldn't classify those ch other minor children as pedophiles yeah. necessarily, but there's an opportunity. Mm. They're curious. Yep. And that's, we don't deal with that curiosity well. That's interesting. You know, I'll tell you what, first of all, I'm teaching my daughter how to box. <laughs> any kind of anything appropriate boom but also um and i'm going to emphasize you know always hey i love you i trust you like you can always tell me anything and i always got your back you know god forbid anything like that happens but you know i want her to like know that she can tell me and know that i'm going to you know have her back no matter what Absolutely. And, and it's like you feel like as a standard parenting you know, a parenting standard, you would all, anybody would tell their kids that, right? But it's right. like, no, in your situation, you see yeah. that it was just, we don't want the people oh. getting in trouble. Like, yeah. Yeah, I got make, that. Go ahead. Make them suffer. Right. You know, yeah. yeah. I got that message very strongly, not only from my family, but from religion, mm. you know, and uh, kind of the way I reacted to it when it first started happening um, with my uncle is I was like, my mind was spinning. I was like, I don't know what this is, but I don't like it, and I had to find truth. Mm. And I was too afraid of my mom to ask her, so I was like, I have to learn to read. And so I had the King James Bible, yeah. and I would sit in church no matter what they were doing to me, and I would try to memorize two to three words a week. Like if, you know, they said ch this chapter and verse, I would find it and then listen and try to line up, like, the visual of the word. Mm -hmm. um, and I, then all throughout the week, I mean, I'm four. I'm like, okay, can I learn three new words <laughs> to be able to identify them? And I could eventually piece enough together before I started school because I was like, okay, I think the Bible's truth. Like, that's the only thing I knew. A, a lot of my coping mechanisms came from a very childish place. Yeah. But that's all I had because that's what I was. Such as what? What do you like? You, like well, so the p thing I picked up most from church was don't hate people. Hating is wrong. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, no matter how bad this is, I'm not going to hate them. And somehow I understood that, and I'm, I understand it better now, hate is a cancer we choose. Yeah. You know, we bring that into our own bodies. And so I decided that no matter what they did, I would not hate them for it. I didn't have to love them. I had to say I loved them because they were family. Yeah. But I didn't have to feel love for them. I just had to be patient until I grew big enough to, you know, escape. Yeah. And, and there's this, the thing with like... I was in the uh, the jungle in Costa Rica. I did ayahuasca thing a few years back, and this guy told me about a similar experience. Like at the end of it, and he was like, "You know," I was like, "Man, that's so bad." And he was like, "You got to show your shadows compassion yeah. because something happened to them or something influenced right. that." You know, and we a lot of times we'll never know. Right. But it's like if you, I don't know. It's like you feel sorry for them that they're so messed up. Yeah. You know, it is it, in an odd way. Like you hate it, but you're also like, God, like it's yeah. heartbreaking that you were able to do something so evil. Right. Right. Like what happened, you know, and you, you wish people, I mean, and it comes to a lot of people repress their, their deep traumas mm -hmm. and they just layer it on. And they, and I think those things build up and that's like in a, in a way like demonic energy or some yeah. form of it that something. just comes alive, Yeah, you know, and it builds yeah. and it stacks up when, this is why I always tell people in my life, like confront the things you're going through or you've been through. Yeah. It'll free you. It will. 
But anyways, yeah. that's my thought on that. <laughs> I mean, just trying to wrap my mind around it. So as you were saying, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> well, the other thing to your point um, that I think about a lot is, is the power that those people gave me over them. Because I'm a kid. I'm just laying there, like trying to survive the moment. I became an observer yeah. of people. Yeah. I'm watching their eyes. I'm watching their faces. And you see a transformation. You leave. You see their humanity leave them to do this. And that's scary. Yeah. And the power that they and my other abusers have given me is truth. Mm. They can't take away the truth from me of what they did. Yeah. That is power. Yeah. And that is mine to use wisely. Right? Yeah. What a powerful way to look at it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you... you in the, the day, like looking at that, you what you gained from it, right? Right. Which I'm sure you're going to share a lot more <laughs> that you've gained from it as well. Right. This episode is brought to you by Middle Tennessee Detail Service, the best vehicle detail service in Tennessee, especially in Middle Tennessee. They take care of my truck out there, and it's always top notch. I'm going to pass it on to their owner, my man Will, and he's going to let you know about what they do. Hey guys, this is Will from Middle Tennessee Detail Service. We're one of the premium details in the state of Tennessee, certified in four different ceramic companies. We do everything from airplanes, boats, RVs, helicopters, campers, and any and every size vehicle in between. We have prices for every budget. We have subscription packages for every budget, and we do everything and anything in between those. Stop on by at 1268 Northwest Broad Street, right next to Crunch Fitness and across from the Sin Federal Credit Union. Check them out. Thanks. So we were talking. Yep. Deep breaths. I've been working on my breathing. I like Important. The, yeah, I hold my breath a lot. It's a stress <laughs> thing. Um, so back to the journey. So you said uh, we left off somewhere around when you were talking about, you, you know, your, you said your childish coping mechanisms, which I think they're – not really. Um, we talked about reading a lot. You're getting yeah. into reading, and then you learned the power of observation. Right. Deep observation. And then that's kind of where we left off at. Yeah, and you make a good point. You know, I say childish, but another word is simple. And sometimes the simple, the most simple solutions are the best. And I think for me, those have been lasting solutions throughout my life. Things that happen later, which I'll talk about, um, you know, not hating, mm-hmm. served me very well. Yeah. It kept me... From being hard, I can't say that I was a soft person. I think I actually sort of buried my humanity for a yeah. long time. Yeah. Um, you know, not hating, not getting harder. I got tougher. I was stronger. But I was not projecting that. Yeah. And especially as I became a mother, I think that was especially important. Of course. Yeah. And I feel like the, the hatred part, like, I feel like it'd be more more of a male thing right like you you know see, yeah. you see a lot of men because men do project anger a lot more often right you know in, through through actions so i think maybe that's more of a male's way of coping right is it build up anger and hatred right right but how women do that is they turn it inward so for, yeah considering what i went through you know what my childhood was or that element of my childhood um i had a therapist once say you know, if I went into a room, a room of my peers and told them all these things that you had been through and asked them to describe you, they yeah. would say multiple marriages, children by multiple father, fathers, addiction, incarceration, and involvement in the sex trade and, and a sex trade. And I'm not any of that. Wow. And so I think if I had carried hate in me, mm-hmm. I would have turned it in on myself. And I would have gone toward those behaviors. Yeah, of course. Because those are things you do when you hate yourself. Yeah. <laughs> when You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I didn't really think about, I don't want to hate myself either. But that happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, at the, the interesting thing you bring up on hatred, um, I, I want to point out, um, you know, it's like anything, right? How you like look at the word, you know, like people say, failure all the time I don't want to fail and like to me it's just simple the only way to fail is to quit that's right. failure yep. that's the only yep. failure everything else is a teacher yeah but a lot of people look at like oh I didn't do this so I failed like no what'd you learn from it 
you didn't fail. Did you learn from it and move forward? Um, same thing with hatred, right? I, you know, it's such a strong word, but I've, I've always looked at there's things maybe about the world or like that people do that I hate, but that's just forced me to like be focused on what I love more, right. not being hateful right. towards them, but like I hate that. So I, and that just shows me how much I love this thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't know. I just kind of like, Maybe I'm making my own definitions of yeah. her no, <laughs> defining no. it my own way, but it's, I, I don't know, observe wording. And so it's kind of like looking at that or, I, you know, when I was going through pill addiction, I hate this person in the right. mirror. Okay, right. I'm going to be better. Right. Right. So it's also how you gear the, like you use those words. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, you know, the thing I, I've learned about hate is hate takes a lot of energy. Hate takes a lot of maintenance. You know, we can rest and exist well in love. Yeah. But to hate, you have to, like, be up here and you have to stay up here. Like, it's going to drain you. Oh, without a doubt. You know, which is kind of that drinking the poison and hoping the other person dies thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, that's why I call it cancer we choose. Yep. You know? I, I, well said. So, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Cancer yeah. we choose. I'm writing that down, too. <laughs> it's the cancer we choose. I'm going to make a writing about that. Okay. <laughs> a writing prompt. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so, moving forward, you know, so you were... I guess from there you're you're gaining you know this observation you were reading you were learning all these different things right you didn't let that hate build up and hate towards yourself right and it you kind of became I guess more soft and compassionate from it in a way um, I does that make sense or yeah or, I wouldn't say but that. toughening you yeah you know at twelve at eleven twelve that's when everything sort of stopped and well eleven is when the last incident happened twelve was when I disclosed and realized that I was not going to get any help. And yeah. 13 is the only year between the ages of 4 and 49 that I cannot recall any sexual violence. Um, so, you know, I, when I was 13, I was like, oh, wow, okay, things are okay. And mm. maybe this is how it's going to be from now on. But then there was an incident when I was 14 where I ran into the house. I mean, I'm in braids and, like, it's, you know, summer day. I'm sweaty because I've been running around outside like a kid. Yeah. Because I was a kid, yeah. and there was a salesman in our living room with my mom. And as soon as I came in, he was in a chair that actually turned 360, 360 degrees. And he turned and faced me and just sort of stopped the conversation and was just staring at me. And I'm like, with my history, I'm like, no, don't stare at me. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Like, don't weird. do that. Yeah. And my mom just kept talking, 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 like trying to like get this guy's attention. And so I'm like, cool, you can have that attention. And so... His chair was right in front of the stairs, and so I just dart up the stairs. I get to the top, and I see him at the bottom. His ch The chair was facing the stairs, like, you know, how men sit, you know, one yeah. leg. Like yeah. he and he had watched me walk up the stairs, and my mom was talking the whole time. And I'm like, why are you not angry about this? Yeah. I mean, I'm a kid, and I'm like, that's not okay no, to mean... let this man, like, watch me like this. Mm. I was like... I hope he leaves soon because I want to go back outside. <laughs> yeah, I would have, I would have dragged him outside. <laughs> like, yeah. no, you're not looking at my kid yeah. like that. Well, so he leaves, and he left his business card. He was a, a, he sold vinyl siding, and my mom was like, "Oh, that a few days later. Oh, he called. He, he has horses. Do you want to go ride horses?" And I'm like, "No, I mean, because I I rode horses with my cousins and stuff. I was like, no, I don't. And she was like, well, he'll come pick you up, and I'm like, I don't want to go, and and for. Three weeks, she was like, come on, he's going to come get you. And I'm like, I, ne I mean, I never, I didn't have the courage to say, why do you want me to do this? Yeah. But, I mean, he was 26. And he was persistent calling. She was persistent trying to get me to go over there. You know, a 14-year-old, a 26, I mean, how's this going to work out? And you said your well, dad was in Florida? Oh, no, or? no. Okay, my, so, my parents are still married. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. His family was in Florida. Yeah, he's okay, from okay. Florida. Yeah. Um, so my dad worked a lot. I mean, I, I don't think he, he had no knowledge of any of this, mm. you know, her, my mom was in charge of home and kids. He was in charge of working very, you know, traditional setup. And so she just had free reign to do with us what she wanted. Um, wow. and that business card stayed on her bulletin board until after I left for college. And I just, I would walk in the kitchen and I'm thinking it felt threatening. Like I had to see that man's name. And it's not, nothing ever happened with him. I never saw him again. 
but it was a reminder of what my value was to my mother. Yeah. And it was very hard to grow up under that. Um, there was an incident when I was 16 where my whole family was sitting at the table for dinner and I don't remember anything being said. I don't think I said anything, but all of a sudden she gets up, comes around to my side of the table, picks up my plate, like slings it kind of downward into the trash can. So all the food slid off, put my plate in the sink. I was like, you're a slut, you're a whore. You're not going to eat at my table. And I was like, only thing I've ever done is what happened with your brother and sister. Yeah. And nobody at the table said anything. I'd never heard my mom say those words before. I mean, you know, I'd yeah. only heard them at school. And I'm like, so I'm a Christian. Uh, you know, I go to church. I'm trying to do everything you tell me to do. And you're calling me these names for something that you're basically denying. You know? Yeah. It was such a mind twist. It was, it was something I couldn't figure out. So from there, I was afraid to eat. I was afraid to ask for food. I... You know, it was never that there was not enough food in our house. There was. So did your dad, was your dad present when she said that? Yep. Or nobody, Oh, okay. Nobody said anything. So he just let things, he just, just didn't get involved. Uh, well, I mean, she, she, her emotions were that big. Oh. You know, it didn't go up against her. So he just was like, oh, I, just, yeah. I want peace. I don't want to hear it. Yeah. And I, I mean, honestly, I get it. I mean, I, I wish it had been different, but I'm not sure what he could have done with the dynamic between, I, I mean, I don't know about the dynamic between them. I can't speak to that. Yeah. But just what I observed. Um, so I lost a lot of weight. I mean, I, I lost so much weight. I stopped having periods. I mean, I was, I was malnourished. Yeah. In a house full of food. God. Um, so senior year rolls around and um, it was December, right around my birthday. And I had started cutting my wrists. Mm. It, they called it a suicide attempt. It was not. Cutting just wasn't a term then. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if you're doing anything to hurt yourself, you're trying to kill yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I'm grateful for that distinction now because I've always known, no, if I wanted to kill myself, it, it would have happened. Yeah. But I've never wanted that. I was in pain. I wanted the pain to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just a way of coping, you know, like, can I feel this? Can I feel this? Nope. Nope. You know, I'm just like yeah. testing myself to see if I had any sensory ability at all anymore. Mm. Um, so a friend at school, his mom was a counselor and she um, invited me to her house to talk a couple of times. And I had never had anyone listen to me like that woman listened to me. And I was just like, is this what moms are? Or is this because she's a counselor? You're like, can I live with you? <laughs> can <laughs> you like, take care of me? Yeah. 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 Um, but eventually, I, I don't remember how it all played out, but she ended up coming to the house sitting at the kitchen table with my parents and they decided to send me somewhere and I was all for it. I'm like, great, cool. Like send you where? <laughs> like to, it was, I mean, I, I say mental hospital, but it was an inpatient facility. Okay. Um, once I got there, I mean, I loved it because the, there were rules that were clear and they were the same all the time. And I was like, well, I can, this is cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not like you, Alice in Wonderland where everything's different every minute. Yeah. Um, and I gained weight, you know. Um, but, I mean, I, to, to the people there, I mean, I got made fun of because they're like, do you drink? No. Do you smoke? No. Have you had abortions? No. I mean, I was just, I was a super, I was almost not a person. Yeah. You know, I'd yeah. never done anything. Yeah. And they were like, well, why are you here? And I'm like, I can't get along with my family. That was my reason for being there. Yeah, you didn't want to like yeah. And, you know, they put me on antidepressants and I was in therapy and group and all these things, but nothing really ever happened. Were you, were you happier there? You were all, yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy to think about. Yeah. Cause you know, you had to get different privileges to like leave the unit or to, you know, they would have offsite activities like roller skating. And I had, I think I probably set a record for how quickly I got all my privileges. <laughs> <laughs> Cause they were like, you're not going to do anything wrong. <laughs> and, um, you know, there really wasn't a treatment plan because I think, I think they probably recognized that I just needed safety and they just let me stay until the insurance stopped paying. Really? Yeah. I was there two and a half months and I was like, I don't want to go. 
Yeah, it was like a vacation. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. That's a crazy thing about because yeah. you know, think it's, all these people are probably trying to get out of there. Yeah, and you're in the opposite. You're just grateful right. to be yeah. somewhere else. Man, right. that's so heartbreaking too. Though, how old were you? You said eighteen. Well, I just turned eighteen. That was my senior okay. year. I, I was missing all kinds of things. I was there January through mid March, mm. and um, but I just I was so done with the chaos. Yeah, and so I look back, even though it's like yes, I was in a mental hospital. That was the best part of my childhood. It breaks my heart. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. I mean, and that's not to say that there weren't other good things. Yeah. It was not all bleak. But when you deny someone's reality and that reality is traumatic, it washes away a lot of the other things. Like I was made of honor for my aunt, the aunt that abused me. I just stand beside her at her wedding, mm. you know, and. You just want to scream it there. Yeah. Well, I. That never occurred to me then. I was so tamped down as a person. They had me under complete control. It just never occurred to me to do anything that I wasn't told to do. I mean, I was basically just waiting for orders. And um, <clears throat> the other thing that around the age of 14, my mom started having medical problems, psychological problems. She'd be gone. She'd have surgery or she'd be in a recovery center for a while and so that put all of the home duties on me um so I was like buying groceries and doing laundry and she was like kind of that super mom who didn't have us do chores yeah so like the first time she left I was like I don't know how to do laundry like okay you couldn't I, just google it from your phone right. yeah <laughs> like uh we need clean clothes but you know and so I just had to figure a lot of it out Damn. and um I just I was put under too much responsibility way too early, especially considering the developmental stages that I had missed. Yeah. Um, so when I went to college, I met um, the father of my children. We met at 19. And later I talked to my therapist and I said, she, you know, talked through like, how did you decide to marry him? And I was like, well, I didn't. My mom wanted me to, so I did. Because mm. um, I, I knew. I knew yeah. what he was doing. I knew he was harmful to me um but my mom was like he's the best you'll ever do or you'll, you'll never do better than him and I was like I don't think that's true but I never occurred to me to say it you know I think at 12 I got brave to talk to her about something truthful and I just after that I'm like I can't trust yeah and you can't put any weight in yeah. her words yeah it just drives me nuts yeah like I you know I wish I could time travel yeah. And I'd like go back to young you and just yeah. like fight people off and like be like, no, we need justice. Yeah. You know, yeah. these people need to be held accountable, man. It's Cause it drives me crazy. Cause it, you know, like, like we were talking about, you know, so many people experience similar things. And right. it's, it's mind blowing when you yeah. really look into it and like so many childhoods are just yeah. lost because of that. Yeah. And that's supposed to be this time of, yeah. Well, you build your creativity and your imagination and oh, you're yeah. supposed to be free and not worry yeah. about all the adult things. Yeah. And no, you're, you're forced with adult, you know, circumstances very young and you yeah. don't even know what the hell is going on. No. It totally wrecks you. Yeah. 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 And you know, my mom, her whole plan for me was to have children. That was the thing for me to do with my life. When I started kindergarten, she came to me and said, okay, you're about to start school but whenever you're ready to have children, you can quit and get married and have kids. Like school isn't the important thing. Yeah. And I'm like, I have five. Yeah. <laughs> and um, when I was 19, or I'm sorry, right before I got married, I had to have a couple of abdominal surgeries. They didn't know what was going on with for the first one. Um, but then I had had to have an ovary taken out. And she, I remember her in that hospital room afterward. I mean, it was it was like a vigil for my lost fertility. I was 22 and she's like, what are you going to do if you can't have kids? And I'm like, there's other things you can do with your life besides have kids. I know. <laughs> yeah. But that's part of, that was part of the getting him to marry me. Cause she's like, okay, well he already says he loves you and he's willing to take you. But I'm like this huge package of damaged goods. I'm like, it, th it, there was no room in me for hopes, dreams. What are my goals? I didn't have any. Mm. Just whatever people, whatever she told me to do, which transformed into whatever my husband told me to do. Yeah. And I lived in that reality, you know, for 26 years. Yeah. Well, 30 years. 
twenty six years of marriage, but twenty six that's crazy. Thirty yeah. years together. I mean, yeah. And I, what my therapist said when we talked about that, she said, you know, I know you were nineteen when you met him, but because you were abused, you know, four to eleven, seven years, she said it's fair to take subtract those seven years from your age. So essentially, you were twelve when you met him, like on an emotional level. That's crazy. And if you think about that. With all that emotional abuse and the dehumanization, that makes that marriage look a lot different. If I'm basically 12 when I meet him. Yeah. 12-year-old's pretty, still pretty powerless. Yeah, 100%. You know? And it's interesting because, you know, I think a lot of that, you know, just obey mindset is very, like, religiously structured. Yep. And, you know, certain parts of it. But also, you know, it's it's weird because you hear opposite dynamics. You hear that obey side of things, but then you hear dudes happy wife, happy life, and yeah. it's and then but a lot of guys that say that are miserable. Yeah, and I'm like, well, I mean, I want my wife to be happy, but it's a mutual thing. You right. you want it's a mutual respect, mutual understanding. Yeah. you know, and it should, it should be that way, not one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, but people subject themselves to those extremes. Yeah. And totally, it doesn't matter if they, like, drain themselves of joy in life because that's just that, I think it's just a conditioned way of thinking. Right. You know, it's pretty yeah. negative. It is. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, I, I can look back now. I didn't realize it at the time, but I look back now and I realize I wasn't a person to him then. I wasn't a human being with rights and feelings of my own. I was a pawn. Yeah. You know, um, there was an incident where he, he was a big pothead and, which is fine, like whatever. But he got word of like, you know, the good stuff. Oh, this really good stuff's coming and I want to buy an ounce. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to college. That's a lot of money. And he's like, you know, he kept going on about it for weeks. I'm like, okay, I just don't want to be there. I don't want anything to do with this. Well, he tricks me into going to the guy's house with him, puts this big jacket of his on my, me, and he's like, you're going to walk out with this in your jacket. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And he's like, yeah, well, you have boobs, so, you know, it'll be hidden if a cop walks up. And I'm like, an ounce? That's a pretty big bag. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, are, you, are there going to be two of them? Like, this is going to look <laughs> weird no matter what. Yeah. But, you know, we go in, and he's like, well, you know, it's, I guess, etiquette to smoke a little bit together. And so they do. And when he paid for the bag, he, like, shoved it down in, in the, like, breast pocket so hard I almost fell down. He was like, you walk outside now. And I'm just, at the time, again, I minimized all of these things for so long. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do because he's a man and I'm a girl. Yeah. You know? But I look back now and I'm like, why? Why did I not react to that? All I did was cry because to I was upset. I was going to get thrown out of school. My parents are going to kill me. Like. But that's just from those childhood situations. Yeah. Well, like, why confront it? You yeah. know? you're. It's it's hopeless. You're, yeah, in your mind, you're like, well, I'm just going to be shut up. Yeah. No one's going to care. Yeah, and yeah. there's a thousand incidents like that. I mean, yeah. I was, well, I was 42 that day in July that I told you about, you know, at the lake house. Like, 42 is when I started waking up. You know, 42 yeah. is when I remembered those repressed memories, which helped me put the reality of my life back in order. Mm. My therapist said to me, she said, um, you know, a lot of people are going to think you're having a midlife crisis. She said, but what you're having is an identity crisis. Yeah. Because you're having to go back. You've lived 20 years with repressed memories and you've made memories on top of that. Now you have to go back and put it all back in order for, you know, those first 20 years of your life. But then you have to reorder everything from the 20 years when they were repressed because you've had children, you've been married, and it was all based on a false reality that you remembered. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was. You didn't. You don't even like at that point. You don't even know who you are at all. Yeah, and right? all of my relationships. I'm like, okay, so this is the truth of my relationship with my mom. This is the truth of my, the, my relationship with my dad. Like, and then of course, family members, extended family members. I, it was just a nightmare. Well, yeah, and that's like a lot to take in, and almost yeah. half your life being gone. Yeah. You yeah. know, like you can't get that time back. No. So now you're trying to figure out who you are and make up for that the most you can. Right. Moving forward. Yeah. And then I will say, you know, because I think you said at 42 is when you started mm -hmm. to see, but you were in denial. Yeah. Right. And oh, yeah. Um, so how old are you now? 53. 53. 
Dang, so that's just a decade ago. Yeah, I, I mean, know. And I think a decade ago, so it feels like yesterday <laughs> now. Know. You know, it's crazy. Um, I was getting out of the military around that time. Uh, well, close. But anyways, uh, just, man, I, mean, I would think this was like a lot further back, you know. Yeah. I'm just trying to think. I mean, I don't know. It's just kind of crazy. So you, you're at 42. Here you are 10 years later. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Well, yeah. tell tell me more because I got I do have some questions, oh, okay. obviously, but I, I want to hear you know more along your journey, of course. Please. Yeah. So, um, I, again, I was in my only full time job. I was a fitness director. Um, I had been a personal trainer, and so this now was over like a group of like thirty thirty five trainers and yoga instructors. Um, my kids were all teenagers. My oldest was about to leave for college. Um, you know, I was doing the best I could to appear normal because I could see in my children's faces like they're like this isn't you mom yeah (laughs) and it was like I would come home sometimes and say I need 10 minutes in my room alone and I mean I was always like huggy mom let's bake cookies let's craft like you know yeah total trad mom and (laughs) suddenly I like need 10 minutes to center myself like I was completely unfamiliar to them and that is the heart. I say the hardest thing about childhood being abused as a child is that it stole 20 years from me. Mm. And in those 20 years was most of my children's growing up. Yeah. And I can't go back and redo that. I was a very fear based mom. I was like, I would be afraid to take them to the park and not know why. Yeah. I was, um, we moved to a house on five acres in the woods. The only house we could see was my ex mother in law's house. So between her having physical, you know, nearness and my mom, you know, being close to me, telling me how to raise my kids, I was monitored all the time. And so he had complete control, even when he was at work, even, even when he was away, there was somebody like, Hey, are you doing the right thing? Hey, are you messing around? Hey, are you, you know what I mean? Just yeah. that, that total projection of like, I'm doing this, but I'm going to accuse you of doing this. Do you feel any kind of guilt for that, for like your kids? Absolutely. But well, okay, let me correct that. I could feel guilt, but instead of letting that have any energy, I talk to my children and I have given them for the rest of my life. I will pay for any therapy you need. I will answer any question you have. If you have any criticism of me, please tell me. Yeah. I'm never going to deny your reality. Yeah. Because I know you were there. But you did the best you could. You know, given the circumstances and your your reality, and yeah. I think you know, gi- given everything and what you've been through, I said yeah. you probably did do the best you could. At least I did. You know, I mean, you didn't know to do any better. Yeah. You but, know, go ahead. Oh, but they're my kids. Like, yeah. They oh, of course. So much yeah. Better. And all I can do now is not do what was done to me, mm. which was deny, pro- project, blame. You know those those things that shut them down. And I'm sure I'm not doing it perfectly, but I think at this point they know where my heart is. Yeah. And And as long as they know my heart is oriented toward them, yeah, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to say the wrong thing. And that matters. Yeah, exactly. Um, And, you know, before we cut this segment out, because I'm going to take that down too, you know, um, you talked to, yeah, we'll talk more about the denial thing too, because it's interesting. You talked about the the trad wife thing, mm-hmm. and me, you know, I'm very traditional thinking in that way. Like I love that. I but I think being a mother is the most beautiful job. Like actually being able to take care of the kids and do yeah. those things is a beautiful thing. And I, unfortunately, society's like got such a bad outlook on that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've always told my wife, like, hey, I want you to be happy. If you want to pursue your career, pursue your career. I said, but, you know, if you ever wanted to be a stay-at-home mother and, like, homeschool and all those things, like, I, that's awesome, too. Yeah. Like, I love that. But, that's you know, as long as you're happy, like, we're, we're right. good. And um, I think it comes down to, you know, a lot of people have a bad idea of the, the trad wife thing. But I think it comes down to, like, the husband actually being grateful for it yeah. and, like, showing that love and, you know, and showing that appreciation and recognizing that, hey, you're working your ass off and thank you for doing so. Yeah. And then it becomes a thing of, like, a fulf- it can be a fulfilling thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you were doing it based off of like, you know, this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah. 
And that's not the way to go. And I don't regret it. Yeah. I mean, given the choice, I would choose that because they're worth that. They're worth that investment of my time and my presence. Um, but it, it was really bastardized in our house. Yeah. You know? We got off around where you're talking about, you know, your relationship with your kids and how you've, you know, expressed them. You know, hey, whatever you're feeling, tell me. Yeah. In a roundabout, some way I've apologized for the time you miss with them unintentionally. Right. And how, you know, what is your relationship like with them now? Like, are y'all pretty close or? Yeah, uh, we are. Um, they all live away from here. So uh, that's tough. I don't get to see them a lot, but I feel close with them. Um, there have been so many instances of them calling me for advice or trusting me with things that happen that I never would have trusted my, I, I couldn't have trusted my mom with. Yeah. And so those are the things that are kind of metrics for me. That's good. If they feel comfortable talking to me. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah. That's a 100% improvement. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> a, that's an amazing thing. So, um, but you know, I want them to live their lives. I, I try very hard to, I, I've never wanted to parent in the vein of only doing the opposite of what was done to me that was bad. It's like, that's not very intentional mm -hmm. if you're just avoiding yeah. negative. Um, but to really um, just be engaged and involved. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I did wrong early on was I didn't see them as individuals enough. I think I, I could have done a lot better job of that. Yeah. Um, but I will say at the time I was, I mean, I was still living in abuse. I was dealing with a lot behind the scenes and I was trying to be a shield yeah. between them and their father. I was trying to show them the good yeah, and protect them from the bad. And in the absorption of that, yeah, I, I made mistakes. Of course. I think a lot of parents, I mean, it's, it's a good intent, good intentions, right. right? You're trying to protect your kid, but yeah. you know, I, I, it's like, you can't protect them from everything. And right. what, what good does that do? Right. And it's like, I, yeah, I wish I could keep my daughter from any kind of pain ever. But yeah. like, how does that help her? Right. It doesn't for life. Yeah. Cause eventually I'm not going to be there. Right. <laughs> so right. it's like, you know, but that's an understanding you have now, but I think you've opened up the dialogue now and been like, Hey, this is, I guess, obviously they're going to know your story. They probably do. Mm -hmm. Um, how does that been for them? Has it been hard or like, how has it been like sharing that with them? Um, well, when all this first, you know, came out, they were younger, Yeah, definitely all minors. And um, especially with the stuff that was going on with their dad, you know, there were, we had a lot of therapists involved and they told us, you know, let them know this, let them know that you don't have to say you know, these things. Um, but the whole point was no family secrets. Yeah. Um, it was hard for me because they were being hit with so much about his sexuality mm -hmm. that he had to tell them. And I don't know, I hadn't done a good job. Being with all that stuff repressed, I did a really terrible job of teaching them about sexuality. Yeah. Because that was one of my fear spaces that I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And so I just became protective and not, um, I didn't teach yeah. the way I wish I would have. Yeah. So then all of a sudden, now we're talking about sex all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in You're this like, very, very weird way. And, um, you know, I think those years were very hard. Yeah. You know, they've, each of them have told me in different ways, like they missed a lot. Yeah. Um, they missed training that they needed from us or from, from me. And I can't go back. Yeah. I can't give that to them. All I can do is validate that that's real yeah. and speak to that now. And be honest about your yeah. experiences. Yeah. yeah. So um, also in that time, like my side of things, I had to talk about things with my mom. They knew a little bit about the, the sexual abuse when I was a kid. Um, and they knew who it was, you know, the aunt, that particular aunt and uncle. Um, but I was still it really uncovering a lot. Yeah. You know, it, it took years yeah. for me to come out, out of all of that. And once I kind of got past the childhood abuse stuff, then it was the marriage. And then pretty soon, you know, I kicked him out. We got divorced. And it wasn't until uh, I had been divorced, divorced for two years that I could say that my marriage was abusive. Like, never occurred to me. Wow. Yeah. And how, how long ago was this? So we divorced in 19, so like 21. 
Dang. Yeah. And I mean, I had my two girls home it was pandemic and, you know, so I was. So there's been a lot of growth these last just handful of years. Oh, yeah. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't date for two years after my divorce. I was like, yeah, I am not okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be that woman out there. Hey, you know, a lot of people though, I mean, think about this, I guess, I'm sure you have, how many people never escaped that fate, yeah. right? Right. So at least you're, you got the opportunity yeah. to use that and move forward through yeah. those things. Yeah. You're still working through a lot of it. Right. Right. But I mean, I think that's going to, we're all going to be working through things the rest of our life. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. But you're, you know, you're, you're utilizing it. Right. So there's a gift there, right? Yeah. And um, I'll kind of fast forward going back to Hannah. You know, I, the, the abuse has not stopped yet. Yeah. Um, I think being relieved of the sexual violence in my marriage made divorce seem like the solution and everything was okay. Yeah. But uh, about a year, um, well, no, about six months after the divorce, uh, he moved in with someone, and I, things weird things started happening. Um, he started calling me with these long, com- you know, hour and a half, two hour conversations about complaining about money and you know, why do I need help from him and all these things, and uh, you know, and it just got weird from there. Yeah, I'd prowl around my property, just you know, threatening things. Like he had a key to my car still. So one day I came out from a store, got in my car, and the seat again. He's really tall. The seat was where it would be if he were driving just subtle little things that's like, such a weird thing to do and you you know where your spouse puts the car seat yeah. that's just one of those things and i got in my car and I, I was instantly shaking yeah it's not like he was like showed up to put gas in their car right, <laughs> you know it's right. not like there's a full tank like yeah. that'd be cool but yeah <laughs> no that's crazy and it's like but if those things get minimized yeah because i can't prove that to the police yeah and so no judge is going to listen a lawyer's like well i don't know what to tell you and i'm but if you think about the culture of fear that that relationship was built on that foundation, that was a huge threat. Yeah. It's like, it's like hey, I'm still around. Yeah, exactly. Can't get rid of me. And it has not stopped. Mm. And my work with Hannah is what has changed my thinking of like, oh, it wasn't just sexual violence that was a problem. It was his need to control me. Yeah. That's the root of the problem. And now I'm just like, okay, now we're going to tackle that. Yeah. I'm not going to live this way. So that's your current pursuit now. Yep. Damn. Yep. You still experience things like that? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, feel free to share whatever you want. I mean, feel free to not. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think everybody can gather an idea based off of that scenario. Yeah. You know? Well, um, I won't talk about the latest one, uh, but it's just weird. Like, he vandalized doors at my house. Um Back when my youngest was still living with me, he was really curious about when's she going to be out of town or I had two surgery, like foot surgeries and like, when is her surgery? And I think he vandalized the doors one during one of those surgeries. That's wild. And he just, it was a forcible entry tool and like two double doors. It's where my, it used to be his kind of shop man cave. And then later it was my gym. Um, And they're just marks all the way up and around. Yeah. Just a temper tantrum. You know, but uh, he has been an email. Uh, I mean, he's just done all kinds of things. But I, I caught, uh, I had a trail camera um, out on the driveway that he didn't know about, and I caught him on my property. Six different photos. So I pressed charges. We went to court, and he has so much influence in that county somehow that the judge was like, "Yep, I don't know if that's him." I'm like. I have people who can testify that's him. You're like, yo, it's not a deer. <laughs> like, no. it's def- It's obviously this yeah. one guy. And he's, like, dressed up with a fake beard and reflective vest. I'm like. What? Yeah, in the middle of the woods. Like, you know, electricity and f- phone are the only utilities we ever had. There's no cable up there. That is insane. That people go to those lengths, too. It's just yeah. like, hey, just move about your own life. I leave. I, how hard is it to leave someone alone? I'm very hard, apparently. Yeah. I mean, that- he, he's been married over four years. And- like, what kind of life is that? Well, I'm curious, you know, on this, you know, you talk about uh, being open with your children. So, you said your parents are still married. Mm-hmm. Obviously, what's come from that? What's the relationship like there? Um, with my mom, it's just very back and forth. Long periods of not speaking and, you know, she'll lash out at me. And there was a, an incident last year where, 
my dad was like, your mom wants to talk to you. We probably hadn't spoken in six months. And so I went down there and um, I walk in and she's kind of standing there kind of like this, like, you know, are you going to hug me? Like, yeah. when you meet her. And so I go hug her and she pulls me close and holds me close. And she's like, oh, my baby, I love you so much. And I'm like, oh, no, we're not doing this. You're like, this is so fake. No. So I sit down and like... <laughs> This is the dumbest story I've written about this too. Like they had a new cat. So the cat jumped on me. Well, I'm not a big animal person, but I'm like, okay, it's the cat. Well, the cat was biting me. Yeah. And so I'm like pulling away. I mean, especially a cat bite. Like (laughs) don't want the cat to break my, you know, uh, draw blood. Yeah. And she's like, oh, sorry. You're so annoyed by the cat. I'm like, well, it's, it kind of hurts. Yeah. (laughs) And so then, you know. And it's annoying. Like I don't want it. No one at me. I'm, I'm only having enough trouble focusing on a conversation with you. This yeah. is a real distraction. <laughs> and so then the cat starts biting me more, and she's just like, Ugh, you're just so picky. And I'm like, okay. But again, I just let it slide, right? And so I, I take a break. I'm like, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I will come back and rejoin this conversation. And she said, um, and so I come back, and she's like, you know what? You're just, you're just, You're so hard. You're uncontrollable. That's what she said. You're uncontrollable. And I was like, I'm 52. Yeah. Why do you need to control me? Yeah. Why should I be controllable? And it was so hard not to laugh. I'm like, you just showed your hand. You want to control me. Yeah. And I was like, I need to go. Good. It's time for me to leave. Yeah. And you know, so I'm like, dad, I'm sorry. Because of course my dad catches it when she and I have a blow up. So I'm always super sensitive and trying not to react to her so that it doesn't make it worse on him. And he's like, it's okay, it's okay. I mean, I was there for less than 20 minutes. So I'm like, I love you, Dad. And I moved to hug him, and he was like, only if you go hug your mother. And I'm like, I can't do that. You know that. He was like, okay. Yeah, he's no, he knows what you've been through. Yeah. That's, and it's like, I, has anybody, I mean, I guess, has anybody been held accountable? No. And in not fact. Not even your uncle and no. aunt. And, no. They still keep in touch with my uncle. In fact, they, um, he works at a high school. And when I found that out, I went to my dad and I'm like, I'm going to call that school, you know. And he was like, don't ruin his life. And I'm like, are you joking? Y'all collectively did try to do so to mine. <laughs> I know. And he was like, Renee, it was one time. And that's when I knew my dad didn't know when I was a kid. I was like, dad, it wasn't just one time. It was seven years, and the look on his face, I will never forget. I was like, she never told you. Yeah. Like, all right, so that's why I feel differently about my parents. Yeah, because he, yet he's still, Yeah. now he knows that. And yeah. Man, I, God, this could be a whole new podcast talking <laughs> about, like, the, the inner, the thoughts and the inner workings of all that and yeah. the accountability aspect and everybody knows and, I don't know. It's pretty crazy, but it, you know, you're right. Still here in the middle of all that, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, we're gonna have to bring you on again when okay. you <laughs> kind of get through a lot of this stuff because yeah. I think you're right in the middle of a crazy season. Yeah. And uh, man, because yeah, that was a really important thing I wanted to ask, but it's just like no one's really been held accountable. There's no no action been taken towards them, really. I mean, it seems like it's all just gotten gotten to the point where everybody's gotten away with it. Yeah. And then they're just in so much denial that they're just going about their lives. But then there's all these lies and this, all this deceit and yeah. all this, this dark energy yeah. kind of just floating around that circle. And you, you want to be freed of that. Right. And, and, you know, for the most part, like I, i personally feel free of that around that same time, they were trying to get someone else in the family to vouch for him to transfer his employment to an elementary school. And I was like, are you kidding? Yeah. Like, why are my parents advocating for this? Like, you know. Like, what is going on? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I mean, my mom still calls my ex-husband her son. I'm like, okay, I I just can't put much stock in that. Man, I I don't know how you do it. I mean, I'd personally be like cutting ties off the world and like, you know, but you you want to help people. You want to advocate, you know, you want to be an advocate for others right yeah well two points i mean first of all i choose to show grace yeah these people especially my mom you know i was born into a generation even though i think for my age i'm a little unusual and having done the level of work that i have like it was still available 
And it's not that unusual for someone my age to have done a lot of therapy. Yeah. She didn't have that opportunity. Yeah, and even nowadays, it's still looked at that, like a lot of people. Yeah. It's taboo for a lot. Yeah. Oh, you go to therapist, you know? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, so I just choose to show grace because that, like I said earlier, that keeps the poison I could drink out of my mouth, right? Yeah. And I don't lose sleep about it. Yeah. I'm protecting my children. I'm doing the best I can for my children. I'm ever trying to do better for myself with, you know, defending and protecting myself. Um, but, you know, their choices are theirs. Yeah. And I've learned the hard way that if I go around trying to correct all the wrongs, then I lose my ability to live. Yeah. And after the life that I've lived, I just don't have the energy. Yeah. You want some peace. Yes. And also the positive aspect of that is advocacy. Yeah. I don't regret anything that's happened to me. I am, I want the abuse for my ex-husband now to stop, but all the rest of it, I don't regret it. Yeah. Because it all led me to where I am and I have a voice now that I actually use and I believe I can help other people. Keep doing that. You know, it's like sharing my lived experiences will hopefully encourage other people to share theirs. 100%. You know, I, I spoke to a women's group at church a few years ago, and um, it was a class that where women were just invited to tell their story, no matter what it was. And so mine was kind of this. Yeah. <laughs> and within the next year, there were dozens of women who came to me with their own stories of childhood sexual abuse, and some of them had never told anyone. And you gave them the courage. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like... That's what my purpose is. Like, I can hold that space for people. That doesn't drain me. Trying to get justice in the court system, I know how hard that fight is. So it's like pick your battles. It's like trusting your vote's going to count. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, unfortunately. Yeah, and with advocacy, like, this fulfills me. Yeah. This feels like purpose. So I had to find that positive aspect. Of course. I mean, it's the only thing you can do, right. you know, like when it comes down to it, like no matter what you've been through in life, you got to find the positive oh, yeah. or it's going to always be weight. It's right. always going to hold you down. It's always going to hold you yep. back. And then your life is just limited yep. to the possibility because you have something there that's blocking you. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, I mean, you're in the midst of this journey right now in a lot of ways. I mean, obviously you're still working through therapy and you're, you're getting a, a lot of healing through like what Hannah does and so on and so right. forth. And you're, you know, trying to strengthen yourself. Um, and you know, you're, you're working through this and you know, no one's been held accountable. There's a lot of like question marks too, of like yeah. what's ahead. And that's yeah. what I'm curious to see, you know, how things lay out. And I think you just, you know, in your heart, obviously you, the direction you're going. Yeah. And so just keep doing that. I think yeah. you're on the right path and you're doing the best you can, you know, but it's a lifetime of, heavy situations that have uh, been piled on you and you're just kind of getting out of the rubble. Well, but for Does that me, make sense? For me though, yeah, but it doesn't feel that way to me. Yeah. Because the heavy has always been there. The heavy is the norm. Mm. Abuse is the norm. So to any extent to which I can, you know, stop abuse from yeah. this person or that person, or then I get lighter. This doesn't feel heavy to me. Yeah, you're like, fl- you're floating above it. Yeah. 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 Well, what are you doing as far as, so you you had the, you know, you spoke to the women at church, but what else are you doing as far as the uh, advocacy goes, you know, to help get, get out there and be proactive towards it? Yeah, so I work with Darkness to Light and Rain. Um, I'm a certified facilitator for Darkness to Light Stewards of Children okay. training program. So that's training that anybody can take um, online or in person. And it teaches um, the realities of childhood sexual abuse, um, how to watch for the signs of it and how to respond properly. Okay. It's like a two and a half hour class, um, low cost. Um, and it, it, that can really change lives. So you like to speak with them and you know, or yeah. nice. So, so yeah, anybody who wants to book a class, I can, I can come to, I can do it virtually or in person. That's really cool. I mean, there might be somebody out here that knows yeah. someone that needs to hear that yeah. about that because I've never heard of it. Okay. Yeah. And what else, what's the other one? Uh, Rain, so that's Rape and Incest National Network, mm. and they lead a lot of um, policy initiatives. So I traveled to D.C. with them in April, um, and we met with um, six senatorial staff members. Um, happened to be impeachment proceedings that day, so we didn't get to meet with the senators. Mm. 
but um, they had bills that we spoke in support of and used our stories um, to land. And I think about half of them have already passed to this point. So that's just been a really interesting. Yeah. You need to be a part of some change. Yeah. 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 That's your goal. Yeah. And then the last thing, um, I would be remiss if I didn't add this part of my story. So in the midst of the years of my marriage falling apart, I found a sport called rucking, which is walking with a weighted backpack. Yeah. 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 There are lots of events that are associated with that. And so I fell into that and that became exposure therapy for me. So that's something you do actively that you just have fallen in love with. And that's cool. And I'm writing a book about that because you know, for, you would think with what I've been through, I would need a lot of coddling softness, like spa days or, you know, those kind of self care, that perception of self care. I think there's like a, a, a two degree people need to write yeah. relaxation like that. But. Yeah, no, yeah. But that's for, you know, yeah. people too. But, um, in effect, what worked for me was this highly authoritative male dominated sport that showed me what men are because I didn't have much perspective on men other than my ex-husband. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this is what it is. So why would I leave when well, I'm just going to change, have somebody else treat me that way? Yeah. And so I get into the sport and, you know, rucking is walking. So the events range from five to 48 hours. And, mm-hmm. you know, so I'm not necessarily friends with these people, but I'm around them for a long time. And we're just walking, you know, through a city. And I just hear conversations or I have conversations with them. And I'm like, none of these guys talk about their wives like I'm talked about. Yeah. And like, they're not rude to me. They trust me to carry the weight and help them out. It was like, it was so eye opening. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I went even further into that sport and that's what I'm writing my first book about. Really cool. I want, I want other women and endurance athletes, anyone really to know that you can find a way outside of talk therapy to kind of work out some of those emo- stored emotions. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, I'm a huge proponent of like physical activity and exercise yep. for like bettering yourself in yep. here, here, everywhere, you know, yep. like I think it is a, it's a, it's definitely a pillar of how to live life. And, you know, when people are had that kind of drive, it says a lot about them too. But I think there's an interesting analogy about rucking, you yep. know, because you've been walking all your life with a lot of yep. weight, yep. you know, and then in and, and the physical sense, you're doing that <laughs> by yep. rucking, right? Yep. And it's kind of like runs together. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's a really cool connection. And you're like, you know what? I, and it shows you what you've been through, but also what you're capable of. And you're like, I can still, you know, move yeah. forward. Yeah. And carry this. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and I but, mean, when I was married, like that was kind of my allowed escape, right? Yeah. I could sign up for an event. And so you know, I'm doing a 24 hour event. Well, I'm thinking about what my therapist and I talked about. Like, this is like alone time for me. <laughs> yeah. Without a doubt. You know? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm the right way. I mean, I'm right there with you as far as like getting out and do something like that. Or even when I just train, you know, or I'm doing all my burpees, I'm like, yep. it's alone time. And <laughs> right. you, you get in a mental space. that's like really positive. Absolutely. You know? So I think that's really cool that you found that. And I'm yeah. excited. What, so when does this book come out? Uh, so right now I'm in the phase of building a platform. So I don't think anybody gets a publishing deal anymore without having a, a big following online. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the book proposal is ready. Okay. Um, so yeah, just building that Instagram following. And Where can people find you? Uh, on Instagram uh, at underscore Renee underscore Arn underscore. Cool. And on Substack. Nice. Yeah. Substack. Cool. Well, what else do you got going on? I mean, I feel like we're, you know, we're kind of bridging towards the end of this. Um Anything else you want to touch on before, you know, I ask my final question? Um, anything else? I don't think so. Okay, cool. Um, so I do want to ask, Renee, and you've answered this in some ways, and I can, you know, but I, I can't answer it for you. At the end of the day, what is your relentless pursuit in both your professional life and your personal life? In my personal life, it is to be an ever better mother to my children. Yeah. Because I know who their mother is. Yeah. Now you do. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> and professionally, it is to help people escape abuse, but also to help people escape the confines of their own mind. Yeah. Break free. Yep. I love it. The first change starts here. Yep. And I want people to know that there are people in this world and organizations in this world who will assist them. Yeah. Feeling alone is the worst thing. Yeah. Without a doubt. And a lot of people that feel that way. So I, um, 
you know, props to you for having the courage to come share all this. It's some some deep dark stuff, but you're you're using it for the best and here you are moving forward and um showing grace to the world and being the best you can and I, I'm excited to see what's ahead for you. Thank so you. I'm looking forward to you coming back when you know, as things unravel more and you move forward, you progress and your book comes out and all that stuff and to hear where you're at in the journey then. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much for this opportunity. Hey, thank you for being here. And I, you know, it was an honor having you. Of course. Honor to be here. All right. Hey, thanks, Renee. All right. Y'all take care.